presenter number one would be Professor Reinhard Gothard. He's a professor from MIT, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, he's been working for many, many years in the area of uh, urban settlement and housing in the third world countries and developing countries. As a matter of fact, he was my professor, and I believe he was also Rafi Samizai's professor when he was studying over there. And I'm very pleased that he came to Afghanistan because we always wanted him to come. Uh, and his experience is very valuable to the contribution of this conference. Professor Reinhardt got it. Thank you. I think a colleague would be better than professor. <laughs> it's, it's kind of embarrassing to be a professor. Um, when I started out many years ago in school, in Latin America, one noticed these uh, developments, these shanty town developments on the outskirts of the larger cities. And they kept growing. Uh, usual reaction is to demolish them, tear them down. But they kept growing and coming back in other places of the city. And so our group in school, we said, OK, we can do something. We got a grant. He said, we're going to design the best self-help housing component that you've ever seen. You're being MIT, you can do that, they say. And so we designed all these elaborate housing programs, uh, these housing self-help components, uh, foam, all sorts of things, foam, bamboo reinforcement, you name it. Built a couple of models. And finally, we sort of woke up and said, this is a waste of time. And he said, we have to do something else. And meanwhile, while we woke up, the squatters kept growing, kept getting more and more. And the problem became much more difficult. So what I want to do today is a little bit to talk about what this whole situation of squatters and the settlements on the periphery of the larger cities. I've never been in Kabul, so I can't really judge if this applies or not. Uh, perhaps some of it does, but I think that's up to you to choose. <coughs> now let me talk about some terms at first. I mean, you've heard a lot of words, uh, squatters, uh, illegal settlements, informal settlements, popular settlements. These are essentially all the same in different ways of looking at it different perspectives. You know, if you say illegal settlement, right away, these people are bad. If you say popular settlements, then you say, wait a minute, this is something else. You know, popular coming of the people. Uh, I prefer to use, for the time being, uh, informal settlements, outside of the formal structure. Okay, to, not to say that they're illegal, not to say that they're inherently bad, but they're just outside the structure. It's a different world. When we talk about these squatters and talk about different policies, I think it's important to keep in mind this notion of poverty alleviation. This is a jargon which has been going around in the field. And essentially, it's the notion is that income is very important. That this is one of the key objectives. We may be doing all sorts of other things with it, but essentially, income is the thing that we shouldn't lose sight of. the context, and I think it's very important. The first thing that one realizes in squatters is that there's lots of them. And they, they grow very fast. You know, we're not talking about a hundred or a thousand. We're talking about many, many more. I think in, they used to say in Cairo that every day you would have 1,000 new people coming in. That's how much in a year. What's 1,000 times 365? 400,000, close enough. Okay? As I understand, they told me here in Kabul that from last year to this year that you had 1 million people move in. I don't know if it's true, but that's a lot. How many is that per year? I mean, uh, uh, per day? Hmm? Either case, there's a lot of people. Are there any, what, do you have any engineers here? I mean, what, what's one million divided by 360? 3,000 per 3,000 per day, three times cargo. Okay, so the, the thing is important, the scale, the speed, 
And for sure, as always, there's not enough money. And this is always the case throughout the world. There's never enough money. And I think we should, we should become accustomed to that. It's, it's worthless to see, keep saying, you know, give me more money, it'll be okay. There is never enough. The other thing is the, the institutional capacity is also very limited. And particular people that deal with low-income housing, they compete with other fields which are perhaps more glamorous. You know, if you want to be a famous architect, do you deal with slaughterhouses? What do you tell your parents? I work with shacks. Ooh. We had some people come to MIT uh, studying squatters, shacks. They come home and the parents say, what are you studying? Glass towers, you know, fancy buildings. Parents get very upset. So, these are sort of the underlying conditions of these informal settlers. And basically what it suggests is that we have to work differently. You know, we can't continue to work the same way that we have been doing. We have to try new approaches. Uh, I think most of the countries of the world have suffered from this. Uh, you know, hillside developments. Uh, Peru, for example, there's a spontaneous squatters. Uh, this is in Colombia. Uh, this is in Africa. And this is also in, in Peru. So there's all sorts of kinds. Uh, they squat on hillsides, they squat everywhere. You may not like where they squat. But what's happening because of their numbers is that essentially they're starting to form their own world. They're, they're, you can't say they're ignoring the rest of the world, but they're outside of it. And what the trend seems to be among professionals is first, you know, in the olden days we'd say, we want this informal sector, we want the squatters to join us, you know, to accept the standard, to fit inside the zoning regulations. Okay, in that first image that you see. But what's happening now is essentially, in a way it's saying that we as professionals have failed, we've given up. We need to figure out how to join them. And what can we adopt, what can we learn from them that seems to work. Now some of the things that you see happening already, uh, programs are adopting these informal kind of service providers, you know, people that sell water, illegally, informal, any name you like. And this has now been recognized as perhaps, instead of being illegal and bad and competing with the government, perhaps we should support this. Let's see what they need. Let's see if we can make it better. This has become quite common, in fact. The other thing which is quite interesting that I find is this notion of illegal informal realtors or agents. Now the question is this, if you're a squatter, let's say you want to squat, right? And you're sitting here, you want to squat, you ask somebody, where should I squat, right? Sometimes. And you say, well, tell me where to go. How big should I make it? You say, no, you go over there, you go over there, you go over there. So in other words, what you find in some countries, I don't know if it happens here, is you have these agents, if you like, or realtors, if you like. And what they do, essentially, is they help subdivide the land to their own interest, obviously. They get a cut. You know, it has been argued that these are exploiters. But what they do, in fact, is that they provide for an orderly kind of development. And perhaps, again, we should look at it, this is something worthwhile to think about. And then the question is, how can we work with them? You know? How can we work with them? They're doing something useful for us. The other thing that you see being adopted from the informal, which is quite common to raise, is microloans. You see them all over. I think that's quite common. The third thing is that essentially this whole notion of legal land titles is no longer seen as being the ultimate, utmost importance. In other words, what you do, what you find are programs that essentially say, don't worry about getting legal title, we'll improve the neighborhood. So in other words, they sort of bypass that. And for various reasons, they got very complicated and so on. So this is a trend that's happening. And instead of us trying to force them to become like us, we essentially have said, we can't keep up. 
let's see and learn from them. Let me go a little bit backwards in the presentation. These are sort of a, a model that you, that if you like, that sort of came out of various water settlements and, or you know, various kind of programs that have been adopted. And perhaps the first step that you should do if you were doing this is to establish some sort of an action team. It's a small group of people, very dedicated, that would like to work with these and understand them. And this team, it's important to have not just technicians, professionals like us, but also community members, you know, people that actually live there. So the first thing, you set up a team. The second thing I think is extremely important is to try to understand the process. You know, it's not to understand, it's not, an, it's not, I have to choose my words wisely here, it's to understand the process and not essentially just to count statistics. For example, if we try to understand the squatters, we do a survey, what use is it if we find out there's 3.2 people per household or 4.8 something like that? Interesting, but what can we do with it? We need to understand the process of these informal settlements. The notion, like who helps you figure out your piece of land? You know, where does the road go? How much do you have to pay? Very important. Okay, so the notion is, I think it's very important to first, first thing you do is try to understand what's happening and to understand the mechanisms. There's several different techniques that you can use. There's a PRA, participatory rapid assessment and so on, which essentially uses the members of the community to help find out information. And this information that you get as they say, it is good enough. It's quick and it's good enough to understand and to start making decisions. The next thing I would suggest is to agree on problems. And to agree on the problems with the communities as partners. You know, not something that we sit and isolated in an office and say, oh, it's very clear, you know, they don't have water, they don't have sewage, must be problems. I think it's important to sit together and agree and decide what's the problem. Then you have to decide, once it's clear what that is in your mind, then you have to decide on what you want to do. Because <laughs> you may not want to do everything. There's a priority in things. For us architects, we have done this several times, but for us architects, when we go to a community, it always hurts us when people say housing is not a problem. And we say, gee, come on, the house is a shack. What's the problem? It's, it's, it's obviously bad. They say, no, we have other interests. Water, sewage, schools. In one case, they wanted um, bus transport to employment centers. Okay, so it's important to jointly figure out the problems and what you want to do about it. And they, well, what you do, essentially, you know, three things to keep in mind. Health and safety, obviously, is, is important. It's important to, to figure out, okay, what can you do that mitigates, that avoids future kind of problems? And lastly, how can you build on the kinds of things? You know, so it's not just a one-off kind of a solution. The next step is essentially an action step after you've done all this. And essentially, the, the, the principle is how do you reinforce the kind of mechanisms, the settlements, of what's occurring now? What can you do to make it better? you like in simple terms. Okay, can you work with the middlemen, the agents? Can you work with the water suppliers? And so on. How can you work with them? One of the things that you could do instantly then, because it's very important when you work with these communities and try to understand it, is to do something. It, was, it, it came up this morning, I remember also, they said, it's important to show something. I think in Beirut even, they said you have to see something. You know, you study and you work and nothing happens is, that's very frustrating, that doesn't work. So one of the things that seems to make sense is to make something that we can call, say, uh, support centers, perhaps. And what this does, it does many things. You see it, uh, it provides services to the community, clinics, schools, community center. It provides an address. If I want to write you a letter and you're living in a squatter settlement, who do I send it to? Shack number eight? 
It doesn't work. You need an address. Say I, say I write you a letter and say, I, got, I have a job for you. So you need an address. It's not to be underestimated. The other thing, when you're building these, it's an opportunity for employment, an opportunity to hire people, to have the community even help design it, help build it, and to hire them, put money into the community. You could even make this a public-private partnership that one talks about. You could model this on traditional elements. I don't know what you have here that, could, that you could build around, but perhaps there is something like that. You could use these as growth poles to drive new development, you know, to cluster around it, so you have a sense where they will squat. And perhaps I would argue doing this sort of thing is probably a very high priority. You know, uh, before you do other things, perhaps this is something you should do, something to build up the identity you know, of a community. Some typical characteristics of almost all upgrading projects. Let me just go again. You know, one that they all seem to do, they improve, they realign roads and paths, and provide for drainage. Almost everyone does that. They provide water, which generally means a water tap. They provide basic sanitation, which generally means pit latrines. In the presentation this morning, it was noticed there's not enough water to go around to build a conventional uh, water system, a sewage system. So pit latrines is probably one way that this is done. This is quite common. They readjust the land, the plots, occasionally, for various things, depending on the layout. Sometimes they even add titles to it, legal title. You know, you know legal title has become a big issue. There's a, a book that came out quite recently where it was argued that uh, one of the reasons squatters can't make it is that they don't have title and they can't use their land as collateral, as a source of income. And so the argument is, if you give them title, they can get money from this and they can capitalize this and then become to join everyone else. I'm not so convinced, but this it's a big argument right now. The other thing they have, health and education facilities, often microloans, uh, and very important recently is this issue of gender concerns. You know, that's integral in almost all the projects that you see. For your ladies, you should be happy. I wasn't, I hate to say, I was in India once, and we were in this community center. And, you know, there was all these ladies there, they looked at me and said, you're dirt, you're a man. You know, I said, geez, I, I didn't do anything. And I, I was amazed, there was a very violent reaction. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know if we're doing it out of self-defense or what, but it is a very important thing, this gender concerns, okay, because it's, a, it's an integral part of all these projects. Some of the policy myths, you know, things that seem to not be true that we thought. You know, the other thing that you always hear, if we fix up squatter settlements, more squatters will come. You've probably heard that, you know, that it's going to make it too nice for them. And then you'll have even more. It's worse. It's not true. That doesn't seem to make much difference. The other thing is that what we're missing in these towns is a master plan to control and guide development. That's what the problem is. Probably has nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing. You know, if the piece of paper has nothing to do with decisions people make on where to squat. Did you look at the master plan when you decided to squat? She probably can't even read. Hmm. So, the master plan approach is irrelevant. Another notion that was trying is to stop the immigration. Let's keep them from coming. Uh, they've tried, uh, you know, regulations. You will not squat. They tried pass laws, evictions, demolitions. It doesn't seem to stop it. It may shift it to some other part in the city, but doesn't stop it. The other thing that you always hear and we can argue about that is to focus on rural development. Don't put money into the urban areas. It's a little bit related to if you fix up squatters. If you upgrade settlements, more squatters will come. You know, the argument is a little bit if you put all your money in rural areas, then they'll stay in the rural areas. I don't believe it. I, I think that the rural areas do get better. You do get better schools. 
so on and so forth, but you don't stop. You don't stop the migration. I'm just getting warmed up. Okay, I'll go quicker. Okay. The big problem is that seems to appear in most cities is that there's an income differential. In Vietnam last year, for example, it was 10 to 1. Your choice is to work in the farm, you get paid barely nothing, or you become a squatter in, in Ho Chi Minh City and you get paid 10 times more. And that's very difficult to think. And then the notion that you have better services, it's the excitement of a city for you young guys. Young guys, excitement, no? You gotta go to the city. And also security. Some project lessons. For sure, what people are doing in most projects, in all projects, you have to have participation of communities. It doesn't work otherwise. You have to keep <coughs> it simple. You know, despite the wish list of things you want to do, the more you decide you want to do, the more complicated, the higher the risk, and the least chance of success. The plan is important. The spatial layout is important. It's not something by the way. Full cost recovery is probably impossible. De uh, decouple legal title with upgrading. We talked about that. Keep in mind, upgrading is a political process. Okay, it's a it's a political. It's a choice. You have a choice of putting money into upgrading or putting money into something else. It's a political process. For sure, you should see it as a progressive urbanization. It's not an instant flash one time and it's finished. It's something that continues on a progressive basis. Some lessons. There's lots of techniques available that the people have used. Okay? For example, here's one. This is a project in Indonesia. Chi is setting it upright. Getting it started, the momentum is important. You have to kick it off well. Decide problems and opportunities, as we talked about. Decide what's important with the communities. <coughs> Strategies. How you get going. The critical thing is, what do you do next week after you work together with the communities? How do you keep the momentum? And lastly, you have to have a party at the end. This is just one example of a workshop at a you participate. There are other techniques that work quite well. So the, the methodologies, the techniques are available to us. Land pattern is important. You have two kinds of, crudely, two kinds of settlement patterns. One where it's irregular, where it's much more difficult. It's much more costly to provide services. What the figures say from three <coughs> to 15 times I've heard. It depends what you believe and how you figured it, but it's a tremendous difference or you have, and the bottom here is also a squatter settlement, where we had one of these realtors, he was helping the young lady decide, okay, you move there and you move there. And look what you have. Very simple to upgrade. The thing that one finds is that squatters want to be like everyone else. They would like to join the city. They would like to do right. They don't want to be squatters. And so, given a chance you know, to tell them, okay, here's the way you do it, then we'll legalize you and incorporate in the city, then they'll do it. But how do you get that information to them? You could pre-plan it, this notion. You know, it's much better. You know where they're going to squat. It's going to be cheaper. You guide the development. The problem is it's difficult to do. You know, land is not readily available in most cities. It's expensive. When you start saying there's going to be a project here, and the, then the value will go up immediately. You draw one line on the ground, the value goes up. Okay, and then immediately, he's going to move in. You know, then you have all sorts of people coming in real quick. So it's difficult. Okay, it's too slow. It's not fast enough. What also happens? You have to be very careful with the image. You know, once the government or foreign donor gets involved and people hear this, then they say, "You mean?" you're going to make us move into this, there's no house here. This is a foreign agency. Come on, you can do better than that. So you have these kind of problems you know, popping up. So you have to somehow try to keep that distance. And when donors get involved, they're very eager about institutions and understandable. The capacity of management is very important to them. And this is a critical thing, there's a shortage of management. 
They're also very concerned about time. You know, there's a finite time for a project to be, which often may not fit the family's priorities. You know, given a choice, do you fix up your house or do you buy new shoes? It's very clear, she's going to go buy new shoes. But if, the, if it says you have to finish within so much, you know, two years, otherwise you're not doing progress in the project, out you go. And then obviously funding is a problem, okay, but cost recovery just doesn't seem to work. And there's a dilemma of dependency. You know, often if one waits to donors to come and say, look, we'll send you experts, we'll send you money, you become lazy. But the problem is, there's a dilemma if there's no money, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a true dilemma. There's been some countries where they would do a project and they sit and wait. Not that they don't know how to do it, but sit and wait for the donors to come again. That's not good. <coughs> then the last thing I would say, there are examples that you can learn. And even in this region, it seems like people talk about the project of Rangi Karachi all the time. It says this is the epitome, or one of the epitome projects you should visit. It's uh, community-based, set up by the community, minimum funding. The KIP projects in Indonesia are also recommended. They say, you know, if you go to school and they say, okay, gee, where's a good project? They say Orangi, KIP, and so on. Okay. There's others around the world. Uh, Brazil has some very interesting programs. It's probably worthwhile to go look. Go visit. Thank you. من کوشش میکنم که یک قسمتی از گفته های از اونا رو به فارسی به شما ترجمه بکنم چرا تجربه زندگی از اونا قدر به این مسائل زیاد است که به حد مسائل تشریح کردم که من تمام شد نتنستم که به فکر خود جذب کنم محترم را این هار در اول گفتار خود گفت که این مشکلات خانه های سر به خود که ساخته میشه یا خانه های غیر قانونی در تمام دنیا وجود داره مثالش اینا آوردن از امریکای جنوبی که اکثریت کشورهای امریکای جنوبی در می مشکل خانه های بی سر یا خانه های غیر قانونی چیستن مواجه هستند اینا گفتن که گروپی از اینا رفتن و در یکی از پروژه ها سهم گرفتن و کوشش کردن که بر از اونا ترهای را پیشنهاد بکنن خانه های خانه های آین چادر یا خانه هایی که از بعضی مواد های چی ساخته می شد دادن اما اینا به این نتیجه رسیدن که تمام از کارا زیادی وقت بود به خاطر که اینا یک قسمت پر مشکل حل نمی که وسط از او خانه های خود به سر به حد زیاد شده می رفت که اینا هیچ نمی تونستن که به مقابل پرابلم از او رسدهی کده بتانن همچنان اینا گفتن که امی خود خانه های خود به سر چندین قسم نام ها دارن نام های مثلا ایلیگل سیدل مید میگن این خانه های غیر قانونی و سکواتر میگن پاپلر سیدل مید میگن یا انفارمل سیدل مید میگن نام های مختلف استفاده میکنن اما اینا گفتن ما ترجیح میتیم که می نام انفارمل سیدل مید سرش بانیم و ای را بایسی یک یک معزله بی خانگی در سر تا سر جهان مورد قبول قرار دادن که انفارمل سیدل مید یک معزله در یک کشور نیز در تمامش کشور ها هسته خب اینا می گفتن که مثلا در چیزی که برای رای حل خانه مشکلات خانه های انفارمل است یعنی غیر رسمی ایست که آیت بسیار مهم است که مردم صاحب آیت شود اونجا دیگه ای که خود امی انکشاف صاحب انکشاف از این چی کنن کنترل بکنن که بسیار به سریع خانه ها چی می کنن سرعت پیدا می کنن مثال آوردن که مثلا در قایره در ماه چقدر مردم می آمد به اونجا خانه می ساختن و مثال شد به کابل آوردن که که طور محاسبات چقدر رفیوجی ما نمی آید و اینا بر ماه چقدر ارقامش البته محسق نبود پیش از اونا پیش ما نیسته یعنی تعدادی از این روز به روز زیاد شده میره به یک پرابلم و دیگه اینا گفتن که مشکل دیگه ای است که 
در مقابل از این مشکل اصلا یک تشکیلات درست وجود نداره مثلا هیچ وقت یک منده سازر نمیشه که بره برای یک خانه برای مردم که غیر قانونی میه کار کنه چرا او موعد نداره چرا نخواهد مثلا تعمیر خوب نقشه نکنه این یک مشکل دیگه است و باز در قسمت از که چطور رای حل پیدا شده رای حل مش... گفیست که ای واز از که ما بخوایم مثلا اونا را جز شار بسازیم رای حل شادی خوب باشه که ما جز از اونا شاییم تا از اونا بیاموزیم یعنی اینا به این نتیجه رسن که تجربه های از اونا در سر تا سر جهان هر قدر کوشش کردن که اونا را شهری در شهر بسازن داخل قانون بسازن هیچ نشده ناکام شدن بلاخره گفتن رای حل خوب تری بوده که ما باید پیش از اونا بریم در داخل از اونا در رای مزونا یاد بگیره که اونا چی کردن و طور مثال گفتم در بعضی کشورها این به حد رایج است که حتی همی رهنماهایی که شما مثلا در شهرها دارین رهنمای خانه این رهنماهای در اونجا در بعض شهرها پیدا شده که پیش از پیش زمین ها را وقت تعیین میکنه که کدام مهاجر یا رفیجی یا یک کس فامیل نو بیا یک ما برش بفروشو بگیرم مگر نال شما که در داخل از برین یک سیستم به خصوص در بین خود امو خانه های خود سر وجود داره که خود از او یک شکل, شکل سیستم است اگر ما بتونیم در داخل از او سیستم بر درایم شاید محصر تر باشیم که پرابلم از او را حل بکنیم و دیگه مسائل چیزی را اینا بس کردن که بعض دولت ها یا حکومت ها در سرزی بحث میکنن که آیا ما امی خانه های غیر قانونی را به اصطلاح تایتل برش بتیم یعنی قواله برشان بتیم که مالک شون یعنی این معذرت تا به حال گفت کدام کدام نتیجه به ای داده نشده بعضی ها که تجربه کرده که امو جایی را که مردم غیر قانونی ساختن امو رو برش قواله دادن وقتی قواله دادن اون موثر شده مردم فکر کرده که خانه خودم شد زندگی خودم شد در بهبود زیادتر کوشش کرده بعضی ها را چی کردن که نه هیچ مای کار که میکنین تشویق میکنن که زیادتر مردم به خانه های بیخ... بی... غیر رسمی مراجعه بکنن در قسمت دیگه رای حل از ای اینا گفتن که خود کمیونیتی لیول پارتیسپیشن یعنی خود مردم امو منطقه اگر سهم بگیرن در چی او بسار محصر تر است نسبت به ازی که دولت راستن برای سهم بگیرن مثلا تیمای بسار خورد روان بکنن در داخل خود امی مناطق خانه های غیر قانونی که باید پیدا کنن که اصلا پروسس در اونجا چی هست یعنی طریقه طریقه چی هست اونا چی میکنن و یا پرابلم چی هست که پرابلم اونا پیدا بکنن و ما فکر میکنم که بسیار چیزا رو نگفتن که ما البته تمام مسائل را که نگفتن ما خلاصه میکنم چرا وقت ممکن است که مسائل اینا مسائل سیاسی را گفتن که در بین است اینجا که اگر ایره مثلا درست بسازن مسائل سیاسی از تو میشه مسائل اقتصادی از ایچ بسار مایم است مسائل سیکیوریتی بسار مایم است حتی مسائل از ای که شما در یک جای میرین زن هاست چنان تجربی خواهد در هند گفتن در یک منطقه رفتن مردم در ارشه گرفتن که تو اینجا چی میکنیم و همچنان نایاد کردن که در بعض جای ها کوشش کردن مردم که پیش از او که مردم برای یک منطقه را غیر, غیر قانونی اشغال کنه و خانه بسازه بعضی حکومت ها یا, یا, یا شاروالی ها کوشش کردن که پیش از پیش یک منطقه را جور کنه برشان که بیاید اما او را هم گفتن که نتیجه مثبت نداده و چندان موفق نبوده و دیگه ای که اینا گفتن زمانی که دونر ها انوالف میشه به این ای کار از بد بدتر میسازه برزی که زمانی که پای دونر در مناطق غیر چی میرسه توقعات مردم بیشتر میشه و از او سوال میکنن که تو که آمدی این خانه ما است مدام اینجوری زندگی کنم خانه ما رو خوبتر بساز پس این بهتر است که دونر هیچ در اونجا مداخله نکنه و مثالش اینا گفتن مثلا در کراچی در, در کراچی گفتن که یک 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 دیولپمنت بسیار خوب پیدا شده با کمک این کمیونیتی دیولپمنت که کسی بخواد ببینه او بسیار یک نمونه خوب است و همچنان در برازیل گفتن یک ما فکر میکنم چون وقت کم است ما سوال های خود در آخر میمانیم و حال از آقای دوین کسک که رئیس کمپنی پادکو در واشنگتن استیت میباشه و ما سینا هم در مسائل اربان دیولپمنت فعالیت دارن ما از اونا خواهش میکنم که پریزنتشن خودش رو کنن مستر دوین کسک okay.
Thank you. Um, I was asked to introduce myself and my uh, company. First of all, my name is Dwayne Kissick. I'm president of PADCO. Uh, PADCO is a firm that works in housing and urban development. It was founded in 1965. Um, to give you an idea about some of the things that PADCO does, uh, in the past five years, we've helped package about $2 billion worth of World Bank, Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, and some USAID funded projects. We've also uh, in the past five years helped uh, package about $800 million worth of privately financed uh, projects. Uh, for example, in South Africa, we work with uh, all the municipalities in the country and private investors helping the cities to bring uh, private investment into airports, into roads, into water, sanitation, and so forth. But besides the packaging of projects, we also work on policy, uh, institutional capacity building, and that kind of thing. And I thought I might just speak a little bit about some of the activities that we've undertaken in the region. Uh, for example, I see uh, Prafula uh, Pradhan was just here. Um, 20 years ago, I actually worked as an urban policy advisor in Nepal um, and worked with my counterparts to help put an po um, urban policy together. It was the first one for the country. Uh, PACO was also operating in the rural sector, and so we got a good understanding about the dynamics of urban and rural uh, development together. Uh, out of that policy document came a, a, a variety of activities, some of which were municipal development uh, projects. So with the 33 cities at the time, we helped them to both uh, develop structure plans, uh, capital investment plans, as well as uh, just uh, means to improve the finances of those local authorities. Um, in India at the present time, I'm actually working with uh, Azar's company, PC himself, to help find ways to bring uh, financing, both government as well as private financing, into the infrastructure sector, whether that's solid waste, uh, water supply, and, and so forth. Um, in Sri Lanka, we helped put together a strategy for the country uh, their top 50 cities and exactly what needed to be done in finance in order to promote economic development and, and that kind of thing. In Pakistan, we work with the uh, World Bank on a 10-city program in uh, Punjab as well as uh, with uh, shelter for low-income communities and so forth. These are examples of the kinds of things that we've done in, in the region and uh, in Azerbaijan and also in Uzbekistan. We're working with water authorities to help them uh, both improve their efficiency, restructuring the authorities, enable them to be able to get financing for uh, World Bank funding, Asian Development Bank funding, and so on. So those are some examples of kinds of experience that uh, PADCO has had. Um, you know, in our opening session, the president and uh, the minister and the mayor all presented a challenge to us, which is to come up with recommendations that could help guide uh, development here in, in Afghanistan. And I must say that I'm quite encouraged by everything that I have seen. Um, I, you have individuals coming from the United States, Afghan Americans uh, here who want to contribute something, who are making very valuable suggestions. From what I can tell, both under the leadership of, of the minister as well as uh, with participation of UN Habitat and so forth, seem to be doing really all of the right things and it's, it's very encouraging. I feel that this uh, conference is also gaining momentum and that some very, very positive uh, things are coming out of it. After I saw some of the presentations this morning, I was inspired by uh, Frank's presentation where he came up with 10 recommendations that we'd like the conference to consider. So I sat down myself and I jotted down 10 things which I would like to share with you. Uh, the first thing I think that's, that's crucial is that um, there, is an, uh, is there is a necessity for a vision to define exactly where you think you're going. So one of the things that I, the reason why I came to this conference because of the name of the conference. Without a vision, very difficult to chart the course of where you need to go. And in addition to the uh, vision, you need good leadership. Wherever I have been, what I have found is that leaders really make things happen. In the case of Nepal, for example, um, the second city of Viradnagar, when we became involved out there, I was surprised to find that this mayor, who had had no training in development whatsoever, had, once he became mayor, he figured out a way to, um, to eliminate some of the inefficiencies in the system, generate more revenues, 
he was carrying out adult literacy courses. He was uh, putting, you know, vaccinating uh, children to improve their health. He was getting the private sector to invest in drainage and so forth. So leadership too is, is really critical. Uh, another thing that I found is getting the policies right and getting the enabling framework right is, is really critical. And of course, that's one of the principal responsibilities of, of the ministry. So whether it's um, economic, uh, an economic framework for development, clarifying the urban-rural relationships is very, is very important. Too often, um, donors tend to think either in rural or urban development, when in fact it's like three legs on a stool. If you take one of the legs off the stool, it's going to collapse. We have to do a good job of articulating why cities are in fact the engines for economic development, why city services are important to the rural hinterland, and why the rural production is important to the city. This is a continuum, and it's very unfortunate when I see that some donors are focused only on rural development and giving inadequate attention to the urban sector because they're very closely related. Another thing that I recommendation I'd make is get the roles right. Remember in the first day session, Mayor Cobble said, I would like some advice as to what, um, what the city should be doing. And let me just tell you what I have found. First of all, uh, the national government's role is really to define the policy framework, the legal and regulatory framework, uh, to do some of the large infrastructure projects that the cities can't do. But certainly what I've learned is that works best when there's decentralization and when responsibilities are given to local government to carry out their, their um, activities in terms of delivering services to the people. As the mayor said, people are coming to him now and saying, this is not working, I need that. That is a normal uh, part of the process. And we need to do more to give authority to the local uh, uh, governments so they can be responsible to their constituents. And in the private sector itself, uh, the private sector in the end is going to be the party that finances most of the activities, that does most of the building, uh, that in fact, in many cases, delivers the services, uh, whether it's schools, in some cases, uh, but most of the development resources that need to be tapped are in the private sector, whether that's companies, individuals, households, and so forth. Another important thing, I think, is to define exactly what needs to be done. I'm very encouraged to see that uh, UN Habitat and the Ministry are working together to come up with, first of all, defining who's doing what, and at the same time, figuring out where, what other things need to be done. You know, I've heard that some parties here in Afghanistan have actually withdrawn because they don't have a good understanding of what they can contribute. It, that is a shame. There's so much that needs to be done that in fact, it's very important to marshal resources from every possible angle, and one of the most important things that the ministry can do is to help define exactly what needs to be done. When we were in Nepal, uh, we were doing our best to bring GTZ, to bring in the Dutch funding, to bring in NGOs. Finding roles for all of these players is, is a very important thing. Uh, doing, I'm sorry, if we could a little okay. bit short. Okay, I'll just touch on just the, the main point. So another point is mobilize all possible resources, wherever that may be. It might be school children in the United States that it can contribute a small thing. To maintain and improve on existing assets. Tearing down houses because they're informal settlements is really not the way to go. That represents a considerable investment. We need to maintain and build upon those. Getting the appropriate standards right. Uh, you know, whether it's a master plan, housing construction, so forth, it needs to be appropriate to the local situation and what they can afford. Promoting financial sustainability is very critical. In Egypt, we're working with some water utilities. We've actually helped them to increase their revenues from two million uh, Egyptian pounds to 26 million pounds just by improving efficiency in the operations, billing and collection systems, identifying water loss, and so forth. So, there is a way to get much more out of what currently exists without increasing the rates at all. I mentioned to engage all possible stakeholders uh, in the process. This is critical. Uh, I think Richard will agree that a few years ago there was a, uh, an evaluation of World Bank programs. It said something on the order of 35% of all projects failed because there was a lack of uh, stakeholder participation. 
Well, today, projects that we're working on require that there is stakeholder participation, that we work with the municipalities, that we work with the communities in order to have them decide what their priorities are. So that's another uh, very important principle that, uh, that's uh, critical. And as we had this morning, the notion of promoting environmental sustainability. This too is one of the main findings of programs like the World Bank, that if, if attention is not paid to the environment, you will pay. Um, I've seen in places like Bangkok where cars could not move for hours at a time. People were dressing their children in the uh, cars because there was so much congestion. There was so much pollution from the cars that you know, people had to wear masks. Their eyes were burning. And there's a huge cost associated with that in terms of productivity, in terms of health problems, and so forth. So it is not something to be ignored. My last point is simply to say that I really do think that how, no matter how grand the vision is, it is doable. It can be done. I was involved in, um, in the Soviet Union from 1992 until 1996. At the time, there was a joke going around, and that joke said, what are we going to do? We're, we're depressed. There's only two possible solutions. One solution is the realistic solution. One is the not realistic solution. The realistic solution is that extraterrestrials will land in Russia and sort out all the problems for us. And the one that was unrealistic was we would do it ourselves. Well, in fact, they did do it themselves. And there has been a tremendous transformation turning from a command and control economy to a market-oriented economy. Uh, a gentleman that I know is in Russia where the consulate could say, what kind of incredible change. Russians have proven to be some of the world's best capitalists, and, you know, restaurants, other kinds of investments. So uh, just as we've seen with Beirut also, it looked impossible that this could ever be the same. But in fact, they have outdone themselves. They have found a way to do it. And I'm confident that the same thing can be done here in Afghanistan. Thank you.